Well, uh, good evening. Um, so I'll be talking about uh, Richard Carrington, who's a, um, a very well-known um, uh, solar astronomer. And you, you, can, you often see his name if we have a big event on the sun, because they always refer back to the uh, 1859 event um, uh, that he observed. And so um, I'm going to, this is going to be uh, uh, some history, some science, and uh, maybe a little uh, gossip, but uh, um, I'll begin with uh, uh, Carrington's uh, early years and then his uh, productive uh, uh, period, which is relatively short, only about 10 years uh, at his uh, Red Hill Observatory. And then uh, next section, we'll be talking about the 1859 event, uh, the solar flare and the uh, ensuing space weather event. And uh, then I talk about the pivotal relationship in Arrington's and uh, Carrington's uh, career. That was with uh, George Airy, the Astronomer Royal uh, of Great Britain. And then finally, his uh, um, really kind of precipitous decline his last years. Okay, I'm going to be showing you a lot of pictures of, uh, of uh, astronomers, but unfortunately, uh, Carrington is not one of them. Uh, we know a picture was taken, um, but it, it hasn't, uh, hasn't turned up after uh, uh, many people have searched for it. Uh, Carrington was born in London in Chelsea in 1826, and he went up to the University of Trinity College in uh, Cambridge. And there he was inspired by uh, Professor James uh, uh, Chalice uh, to take up astronomical studies. And the map I'll, I'll be giving um, uh, Carrington's lifeline. So from Cambridge, uh, he goes up to Durham. Now Durham is, um, was the, the third university in the UK. It was uh, uh, came 500 years ago, Cambridge and, and Oxford in the 1830s. And Carrington worked there from 1849 to 1852 as, a, as an a, a assistant in the um, observatory. And he uh, through, throughout his whole career, he was indefatigable. He just, he was a worker, and so he looked at minor planets and comets. He uh, got a very precise longitude of the observatory. He observed the eclipse in 1851, and in uh, that year, he was elected a, a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society. Uh, Temple Chevalier was the astronomy professor at. Durham, and he was the director of the observatory. He was Carrington's first and his last boss. Um, uh, Carrington, um, uh, uh, Chevalier was, by all accounts, a, a very decent person, and I think relatively easy to work for, but uh, Carrington wanted to, uh, he thought the observatory was ill-equipped. And so in 1851, he made a proposal uh, to the observatory. He was very wealthy. His father was a, owned a brewery. And, and Carrington said he would loan the, observ uh, the university money so that they could buy, get better instrumentation. And he made that proposal um, uh, because, uh, as he says, uh, uh, his private position uh, renders him unwilling to fill a subordinate to position. He wanted to be uh, his own boss, although he had come to Durham uh, for a while to gain some experience. And so he met with the board, and at first the proposal was uh, well received, but then uh, he said in the course of three weeks, some adverse influences prevailed, and we met next. Uh, there was so much bitterness and opposition that I, I resigned. And uh, it's almost certain that the um, uh, adverse uh, influence was uh, the Astronomer Royal, and we'll see more of that uh, later. Okay, so from Durham, he went to Red Hill. That was uh, the name of his observatory. It was outside of Rygate, uh, south of London. And he was a, a night and daytime astronomer. He, I think like a lot of uh, solar people, he started um, uh, looking at the stars. And um, um, so he made a catalog of polar stars. Uh, but his uh, principal work and the work that he's remembered for was uh, at, uh, on the sun. And so... He determined uh, uh, for the first time the uh, very precisely the elements of the uh, sun's axis of rotation. He discovered the latitude of variation in uh, latitude variation of sunspots over the solar cycle. Uh, he discovered solar differential rotation. It just means that the sun doesn't rotate 
as a solid body. It rotates faster at the equator than the poles. And uh, serendipitously, uh, co-discovered the first uh, solar flare. And uh, this is his Red Hill Observatory. The residence is on the left of the observatory, of course, on the right. Uh, some key uh, events in his life uh, in the late uh, uh, 1850s, the uh, most significant one, uh, his father died. And um, so uh, not only uh, was he, uh, you know, a full-time astronomer, but now he had to run, uh, he was the uh, uh, eldest son, he had to run the, uh, the family brewery. Um, he started to be recognized for his work in 1859 he would get the RAS uh, gold medal for his um, uh, catalog of uh, circumpolar stars uh, that he worked on uh, during the, the, the uh, mid 1850s. And in 1860, at a relatively young age, elected a fellow of the Royal Society. Now, before I get into his solar work, I'd like to just set the stage a little bit. This was the, uh, the, the the, uh, the middle of the 19th uh, uh, century was uh, was the, the second age of uh, second golden age of solar physics. Uh, the first one uh, was the flurry of activity around uh, uh, 1610 when the telescope was invented, and Galileo and the others got the first observations of sunspots. Um, the second golden age too was uh, uh, signaled by the work, uh, also by uh, work on sunspots and. So sunspots had been observed sporadically, haphazardly, and sometimes with more or less fidelity over uh, um, 250 years. And it wasn't until a very serious uh, campaign to count the spots on the sun was begun by uh, Samuel Heinrich Schwab in 1826 uh, that, uh, that, the, that after observing for um, you know, a quarter century, or less than that, actually, it was in 1844 that he um, uh, realized that the sun had what he called a, a decennial period, a 10-year period. Today, we recognize it as, as, a, as an 11-year period, but that's an average value. Some uh, uh, cycles are shorter, some are longer, but it averages out to about 11. And the various columns here, you can see the, um, uh, the, the in the second column, you can see the um, uh, the sunspot cycle, the uh, a number of uh, spots, uh, peaks every 10 or 11 years. Uh, you can see it even kind of more graphically if you look in, at the number of spotless days on the sun. And there, uh, the minima show up at uh, 11 year intervals. And these are the number of days that Schwab observed. He observed uh, uh, every day that he could find a, a, a patch of uh, a sunlight, and you can see it's quite a remarkable record. And he went uh, uh, to go on observing until um, uh, 1867. So that was uh, that was the, the key discovery. Now Schwab was a, was an amateur. He published in a, you know in, in one of the leading journals, uh, but uh, no one paid attention until someone who was very well known, uh, von Humboldt, uh, wrote a series of books, uh, uh, Cosmos. Uh, in uh, six volumes, and in the third volume, he uh, reported um, uh, um, uh, Schwab's uh, uh, finding of, of the sunspot cycle. And uh, then things began to happen very quickly. Uh, and the uh, key beneficiary of that was um, an Irish astronomer who was working in the United Kingdom, uh, Edward Sabine. And uh, Sabine uh, was the director of the British colonial observatories scattered around the world, uh, Toronto, uh, Hobart, and, and Tasmania. And he had six years of data. And he was very lucky because his first year was a year of a sunspot minimum, uh, 1843. His second year was the year of maximum in 1848. And he looked at uh, what he called the numbers. That's the um, um, uh, uh, numbers of, uh, of storms that he saw in the geomagnetic and magnetometer data, and also the intensity of the storms, which is the values. And uh, both of these also showed uh, minimum in 1843 and, and um, maximum in 1848. So uh, uh, Sabine was very lucky. I mean, he 
he got the uh, uh, coincidence of the two cycles with a minimum amount of magnetic data. Fortunate in another sense that often the, uh, the geomagnetic uh, activity doesn't track solar activity that faithfully, and this was a really good example of a time when it did. And he had a, a third leg up because his wife was translating uh, von Humboldt's Cosmos from German to English. And so he had a sneak preview of uh, a Schwab's result, even though it had been out there, you know, buried in the journals for years. And uh, uh, so he, he announced this discovery and within two months, or uh, and within a few months, uh, two other astronomers, um, our natural philosophers in uh, and, uh, Switzerland uh, came up with the same result. And uh, so Sabine uh, then got the lion's share of the credit. Uh, today we'd recognize this as an example of, um, you know, multiple independent discoveries and, and they usually be shared equally. So uh, his first uh, thing to do before he could learn anything about the sunspots, he had to uh, determine precisely where the spots occurred on the sun. And to do that, he had to determine the elements of the sun's rotation axis. And uh, Carrington's result for the, um, uh, the inclination and the right ascension is shown by this plus sign here. And here's the, his uh, error circle. And all of these other symbols and letters are uh, uh, people who have uh, attempted to do the same thing over the years, some before, uh, but the bulk of these are, are more recent ob uh, observations and uh, determinations. And um, you can see just how good it was because I think he wasn't really improved on until uh, about 50 years later with these two determinations, with, which were just a year apart, basically by the same people. And the most um, recent uh, determination of the... Um, elements by Beck and Giles in 2005 still falls within his uh, uncertainty. Uh, his next discovery was the discovery of the latitude variation of sunspots over the cycle. Uh, so what you have uh, here is a plaque uh, of, um, this is the solar equator. These are spots in the northern hemisphere of the sun, in the southern hemisphere, and this uh, uh, it goes over uh, seven or eight years. And you can see, we'll start with this cycle here. The uh, spots start at a, at a um, uh, high latitude, uh, high latitude, maybe uh, 30 to 40 degree, degrees, something like that. And then they tend down toward the uh, equator uh, over time and, and, and get there after about 11 years. And then it starts over again. And so um, Karen... Carrington had, had great ways of expressing himself. And this one is so accurate about uh, the uh, people who work with the sun really appreciate this. I'm sure it's true in any branch of, of science, but he said this is another an, uh, instructive instance of the regular irregularity and the irregular regularity, which in the present state of our knowledge, and that holds true today, appear to characterize the solar phenomena. But we're making progress. I shouldn't, I shouldn't sell it too short. Um, this is um, uh, Carrington, uh, Carrington's uh, um, discovery was term, was discovered several years later uh, by uh, Spohr, and so it's called Spohr's Law, and then it was shown graphically for many cycles by uh, Maunder, and uh, you can see why it's called the uh, butterfly diagram. Uh, his third discovery was of the sun's uh, differential uh, rotation. The sun rotates faster at the equator uh, than at, at the poles, and it's significant. It's like 25 days at the equa equator and about 30 days at the poles. And the way he showed that, this is, these are plots of sequences of sunspots, and they're at different, uh, uh, different latitudes. And so we focus on a low latitude one here and a high latitude and so they're observed every day. So this is one, two, three, four. In Conum, there's uh, 13 days here. That's the amount of solar rotation period is 27 days, roughly, uh, at mid-latitudes. And so this is the time when you see them, when they're on the disk before they go behind the disk. And the sun is uh, rotating in this direction. And relative to a fixed merid uh, meridian, uh, here the... Um, um, 
the, the sunspot um, is approaching that meridian. It's going uh, uh, faster than the general rate of rotation, and here it's lagging uh, for a high latitude spot. And uh, uh, Carrington uh, set this all up. He did a very British thing. He set the prime meridian on the sun on uh, 9 November 1853, just like the prime meridian go, uh, goes through Greenwich, and he did it for the sun. And uh, that his determination is uh, that's uh, continued to this day. Uh, so uh, there's Carrington rotation one in November of, um, of uh, 1853, and now we're up to about uh, uh, Carrington rotation uh, number 2300. And then it's also referred to as uh, uh, Carrington longitude. Uh, Agnes Clerk was a, uh, a, 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 a real-time historian of astronomy. Instead of writing review um, uh, papers, she wrote review books, and, and they were so good, and she was so insightful. Even though she was not a trained astronomer, she just read and thought, and uh, they, they became uh, necessary um, textbooks for their libraries. And um, of her, um, Alan Chapman, who's a distinguished um, English historian, said that no other single figure has a better case when it comes to be, be, uh, being considered as the founder of the history of astronomy as a serious scholarly study than uh, Agnes Clerk. And this, um, what uh, a clerk said here about, uh, you know, this um, uh, a differential rotation, I mean, uh, the backdrop to this is um, uh, Kirchhoff and Bunsen in 1859, the Kirchhoff's Law, so you could finally determine the constitution of the stars. It was the birth of uh, uh, astrophysics. And she thought that for the sun, it was, it was actually more important. Uh, Carrington's finding was more important. And then the first observation of a flare uh, independently with Richard Hodgson on 1 September 1859. And these are very early uh, photographs. These come from the uh, uh, Cambridge University Library. And uh, this was a series uh, of observations that was started by a pioneer of solar photography, Warren Delarue. And he was uh, uh, pretty far along uh, by 1859, but it took him a while to get there. And there's the only other existing photographs from uh, De La Rue that were earlier to this were only about uh, about a year before, but these, these are uh, quite respectable. And the region in which the, the uh, big flare occurred was uh, here. And then uh, this is on the 31st of August. Uh, it must've been clouded out uh, until the third and then uh, or for some other reason, and then here uh, it's rotated uh, closer to the disk here. And uh, you can see that um, even though uh, that um, uh, this is a, a, a blow up from the previous figure and this is a spot group, and you can see it's, it's quite grainy and it doesn't, uh, it's not as nearly as good as uh, Carrington's uh, de uh, detailed sketch. Um, but um, you know this is this is an, uh, an important work by uh, both of these people. Okay, so we so we had the observation on the sun, and that that was the first uh, flare that was ever observed. I'll go back to that. It was observed in white light, so you have the spot group here, the umbra, the dark areas, the penumbra, and against that you see these kind of little uh, kidney-shaped things here. There are patches of white light emission, and then. Um, Carrington uh, was observing that day, um, since he had been running the brewery at, uh, during this period, he often had a, um, uh, a hired observer uh, do this, but fortunately he was there that day. And he said uh, in his account, he, he ran into the residence part of the house looking for someone to uh, confirm his observation. I think his nephew was staying with him at the time and uh, he couldn't uh, find anyone. And he came back a minute later and he said he was mortified to see that these uh, spots had become much smaller and, and uh, had moved. Uh, but fortunately, um, there, this was confirmed. Now, uh, so, um, so that was the solar part of the first solar terrestrial event. Uh, this is part of the 
uh, 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 terrestrial uh, event. And at the same time, uh, okay, so these are magnetic traces here, two different components of the magnetic field. And these observations are just as good and as regular, and they show the same kind of diurnal variation on quiet times uh, today as they did then. And so this is a great resource. This is, uh, these observations were started around 1830 and became uh, institutionalized at Greenwich in 1841, I think. And um, so you can see there's, um, uh, it's historic in itself, but it's historic uh, twice over because in this um, uh, red box here, it says, uh, the above movement, above movement was nearly coincidental in time with Carrington's observation of a, a bright eruption on the sun. And uh, this is just when, uh, this is the type of um, um, what's called a sudden ionospheric disturbance. And these were just beginning to be understood uh, uh, in the 1830s. And this is by another um, uh, English sunspot observer uh, from this one from Greenwich, uh, Harold Newton. And this is in, uh, you know, 80 years after the, after the Carrington flare. And uh, what happens to, to, to create these disturbances, another one of those would be a um, shortwave fade or a blackout of high fre frequency uh, wave communications is that uh, ionizing radiation from the sun, uh, uh, soft x-rays come and create, um, increase the ionization in the um, lower regions of the uh, ionosphere uh, that uh, makes currents uh, uh, stronger and creates stronger magnetic fields, which are observ observed at the Earth. So this is the, the, a prompt effect of a uh, solar flare. The solar flare has three principal emissions. One is uh, electromagnetic across the spectrum from uh, X-rays to radio waves. The other one is uh, they get to the Earth in eight minutes uh, the most energetic particles, uh, relativistic protons, uh, get to the Earth um, longer, and it's because their uh, path to the Earth is curved. They don't follow in a straight line. They take about 11 minutes. And the one that causes uh, all the damage and the one that's the, that poses a systemic threat is are the great uh, storms. And those are called, caused by uh, plasma emissions from the sun, a big ball of uh, plasma um, ionized uh, gas comes out and, and, and magnetized, and that's uh, called a coronal mass ejection. Excuse me, or see me. And so uh, 17 and a half hours after the flare, uh, all heck broke loose on the, on the um, uh, magnetometers, and the traces are offset uh, by 12 hours uh, for precisely this reason, so this, these hash marks don't run over each other. And the problem with these uh, early observations is uh, um, they didn't realize how big storms uh, could get in. So you see this, these gaps in the data here when they went off scale. So we have to uh, do clever things to infer how, how uh, big the storm might have been for the Carrington event. Uh, and one of the ways we do that, and I'll get that a little bit later, is um, by looking at the the um, um, lowest latitude of, of uh, aurora. Uh, when you have a very strong event, uh, 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 aurora are observed frequently in the polar regions, but when in a big event, they they go to lower latitudes, and and the the the, lat the lower the latitude, the the stronger the storm. This one, this observation, this is from um, Flagstaff Observatory in Melbourne, Australia. So the observation of the uh, one September event was almost uh, uh, in all uh, London affair. Uh, we've gotten uh, more recently observations, uh, magnetic observations that were made elsewhere, uh, particularly in, in the India and in Russia. Uh, but uh, at the time, uh, everybody, uh, I mean, the, uh, the day after uh, Carrington saw the flare, he went over to Kew Observatory and talked to Balfour Stewart, Stewart and looked at his uh, magnetometer records. But the three principals in London, uh, first was Hodgson. Uh, he, he knew, uh, it was an, uh, an acquaintance anyway of Carrington. And he was observing from Highgate, north of London. The green area is the rough uh, urban area of London in 1859. And Carrington was in Red Hill. 
Hodgson, uh, uh, is, is, uh, uh, prosaic about it. He, he said the magnetic instruments at Q were simultaneously disturbed to a great extent. extent. And so he's talking about uh, just that prompt uh, um, solar flare effect. Uh, Stewart at Q Observatory, where this record comes from, this is what the magnetic, uh, uh, they called the magnetic crochet at the time of the flare was called. Uh, was observed, and then uh, 17 hours later, uh, uh, the great storm. And he said, uh, uh, is it not possible to suppose that in this case, our luminary, the sun, was caught in the act of uh, creating uh, magnetic disturbances? Carrington was much more cautious. He said he would not have it supposed that he even leans toward hastily con connecting the solar event and the magnetic uh, activity and uh, quoting Aristotle, I think he says, one swallow does not make a summer. And this is very much in keeping with Carrington. He did not uh, like to go uh, uh, very far beyond the data. So remarkable aspects of the Carrington event, it was observed by two people. People had been observing the sun for 250 years and hadn't seen a flare. And, and then uh, the first one was observed uh, uh, and con immediately confirmed. It's the first recognized solar terrestrial event. The, you know, we saw both the, uh, both the flare at the sun and the disturbance at Earth. It, it didn't have to be that way um, uh, because uh, the first flare, if it was, if it was uh, cloudy at London, uh, you, know, you wouldn't have the, the, the uh, two aspects of it. And um, and uh, the the uh, occurrence of a geomagnetic storm in particular is very um, is strongly related to where the flares on the sun. So the flares on the uh, uh, center of the sun, uh, then you're likely to um, uh, to have a um, magnetic storm. If it's off toward the limbs, uh, then you may well see the flare, but not see the um, um, see a geomagnetic storm anyway, you would still see the, the prompt uh, 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 electromagnetic uh, effects. Uh, and so uh, both of these effects were observed for the storm. Both are arguably the largest uh, uh, ever recorded. And the uh, active region was the likely source of a, a, a great storm in Aurora, not as big as the Carrington event uh, on the 28th of August. Okay, so um, where, where does the space, uh, the 1859 uh, space weather event rank in comparison with these other extreme events in terms of the electromagnetic emissions, the flare, the chrome mass ejections, uh, the magnetic storm, aurora, and proton events? So I'll go through each of these in turn. Okay, so. Um, this is, this is uh, some work I was in, involved in. Sometimes I'm quite proud of, of because we reali realized, a, a colleague and I realized that um, we could get a guess at how big the um, uh, Carrington event was. And um, so here we have the magnetometer trace and you can see this is the magnetic crochet here because it's this hook-like and um, so the records the same were uh, are just as good uh, uh, then as they are now, and so we have the records now, and we can look at a disturbance like this. And in this case, we know what is causing it because we have these records from space of the soft X-ray event and seen in the top panel over here. And so we can take an event and see if it was comparable to the Carrington event, and then we can look and see what kind of X-ray event uh, produced that. And so, so here you have the X-ray emission and here's the response at Earth in the three components of the magnetic field. And in each of them, you can see this uh, sharp uh, response there uh, at different uh, uh, magnitudes in, in each of the uh, traces. And, and so from that, then you can make inferences about uh, how big the, um, uh, the Carrington event was. And so what we did was just made a table of um, 
uh, current events uh, for which we had observations and uh, earlier events for which um, we might have, uh, some of which we only had the um, um, solar flare effect for. And so if you do those kinds of comparisons, we said that uh, this event was conservatively greater than X10. Now X10 is how you uh, quantify X-ray events. So they can go anywhere from the, the lowest levels are C-class, then M-class, then X-class, and X-class can go from X1 to, you know, uh, the highest they get is generally is around X30 or so. So we said it was conservatively greater than X10 for carrying an event. And then subsequent uh, determinations were made. Uh, the first one was uh, uh, by Clark et al. in 2010 of X40. And more recently, and that was done using the same kind of magnetometer observations, and more recently using the white light observations from Carrington, uh, they get something on the order of uh, 56, X56 with this kind of uncertainty. Still, still the largest event that's ever been uh, inferred or observed uh, uh, for which we have, you know, at least uh, some kind of solar, well, I shouldn't say that. If you go back, there's some of these historical particle events, uh, which uh, it can be, uh, appear to be very large, and you, you can infer um, uh, flare sizes much larger for them than, than have been observed yet. But there's still, um, because they are so large, there's still some lingering uncertainty about you know, uh, if, if they're being um, analyzed uh, correctly, because that comes from um, observations that go back uh, hundreds, thousands of years in uh, uh, tree rings and ice cores of what are called uh, cosmogenic nuclides. Okay, this is uh, coronal mass ejections. Until 50 years ago, uh, we had no idea, uh, uh, well, no good idea that the sun could produce these spectacular eruptions. The only time you could see uh, them be, uh, before was at the time of a solar e eclipse. And in a solar eclipse, um, you might see uh, things like this, but they, they could be, uh, you couldn't make a movie of it. So you would see a static thing and maybe it's just a, you know, a stable uh, feature of the corona, um, which uh, can only be a se seen when you either during an eclipse or you artificially, artificially occulted. And so in this, uh, image here, the inner circle is the sun and then the occulting disk, and then the CME is seen over the occulting disk. And so for the early events, one way that you can get an estimate of how energetic they were is how long it did it take for the mass ejection from the trap uh, to travel from the sun um, in the time of a flare till you see the onset of a geomagnetic storm at Earth when a plasma cloud and the shock it drives hit, hits the Earth. And so uh, the, the fastest event ever from the sun to the Earth was an event in August of uh, 18, uh, 1972, uh, 14 and a half hours. Uh, the Carrington event was about 17 and a half. Uh, two uh, recent events uh, from the same region on consecutive days in October of 2003, it came in at about 20 hours and then one in July. This is a more typical uh, 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 30 hours, 40 hours, and some even you know longer than that. Um, so uh, for a severe geomagnetic storms to get to see how the Carrington event uh, stacked up against uh, other uh, large historical events and modern events, uh, we have uh, uh, geomagnetic indices, which just is a measure of the, the offset of the uh, uh, magnetometer traces from the normal daily curves, just a kind of amplitude. And there's different uh, sets of stations uh, that uh, uh, measure different aspects of the storm. And uh, But the two that are used, there's one really long-running one that's called the A, A index on the left and a more modern one, uh, a D DST index on the left and on the right. And so for the AA index, you see that the uh, largest event in modern times was a storm in March of 1989 that uh, shut down electricity in, in uh, Quebec for uh, nine hours. It's, uh, I think, the most severe uh, solar terrestrial impact uh, that's yet been observed. Um, 
And you can see that that event was, uh, what we can infer for the Carrington event was something about two times larger than the March 89 storm. And for those of you who saw the Aurora uh, this year in May, uh, that, was a, that was a good sized event. It was uh, um, uh, not as large as, as the March 89 event, but it, it was healthy in terms of its uh, DST index. Now, um, the, we think that there were two other storms that were uh, comparable to the Carrington event. Both were observed um, uh, 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 some time ago uh, for the four, uh, February 1872 event. Um, that... Um, both of these were observed uh, primarily at, at single stations. We, it, it, there's other, at other stations, they may have gone off scale. Um, so the, the records are, are, are compromised uh, for all of these. Um, but we think that they, all three of these events were comparable to the Carrington event. And two of them actually show um, uh, lower latitude aurora. But uh, with these uh, historical auroras, it's all kind of hit and miss. Uh, uh, who is looking uh, when, uh, and um, uh, so um, um, this, these observations are are more more sporadic and less reliable because of that. So, uh, so just to put the various rankings together for the flare and the solar wind, uh, here they are: the flare is first, the solar wind speed, uh, sun to the earth uh, uh, time, transit time is second. Uh, magnetic storm size, it's in the, it, it, we can safely say it's in the top three, and all of those bands seem to be comparable. Um, and for equatorward auroral extent, it's third. And proton event is something um, we really haven't gotten uh, a, a strong confirmation. That's, and that's quite surprising that there was a, a proton event for the um, uh, Carrington event. And there's just a recent uh, paper out that that suggests that was the case, but it, it's uh, a little bit ambiguous. So you can call uh, the Carrington event the space weather is a hundred year flood. Now the contemporary impact of Carrington's observation on uh, what other astronomers were astronomers were doing was um, uh, everybody was aware of it. You, it's, it's it's quoted a lot uh, uh, over the years, but um, the the observation of a, a white light event was unique or was a was viewed as such because of the poor scientific communication and there was confusion regarding the prompt and delayed effects that it caused the prompt event which is a relatively small disturbance that you can see often for other reasons and they didn't know how long it you know it took for a disturbance to come from the sun to the earth so it was it was hard to match up uh, uh, um, uh, storms with uh, solar effects, and uh, and then uh, Lord Kelvin uh, just flat out uh, didn't believe it because he thought it was wasn't. I mean, he was a really a great scientist, and his arguments were sound, but he didn't know about the uh, solar wind. He didn't know about cor coronal mass ejections, and so as a result, Carrington's event was only a tantalizing clue, and people began to even wonder, you know, about that original connection. Uh, between the sun and earth based on the on the solar cycle uh, seen in magnetic data and so finally um, this uh, Maunder who who was a leading uh, English sunspot observer after uh, Carrington uh, was able to say our magnetic disturbances have their origin in the sun and he did that uh, using uh, Carrington's uh, uh, his rotation system and his longitude and uh, this, uh, what's plotted here are, um, this is, goes from 1883 to 1903, and these are the numbers of the Carrington rotations. And this is uh, during the time uh, of the rotation, the 27 days uh, takes to uh, rotate um, all geomagnetic disturbances. And this plot doesn't look terribly convincing, but, uh, and it's kind of messy, but what, um, Maunder uh, drew attention to and, every, and eventually convinced everybody was that, that uh, these storms uh, were recurring uh, every 27 days with 
the rotation period of the sun. So now you are not seeing just the the solar cycle variation in geomagnetic activity, but you are seeing it uh, um, in the um, in its uh, rotate. You are seeing the rotation period in the magnetic uh, uh, data as well. And so that that uh, clinched the argument, and and no one uh, looked back after that. Okay, now uh, Carrington and Airy. Uh, uh, George uh, Bedell Airy was the Astronomer Royal for uh, 45 years from uh, 1835 to 1881 and also made him director of uh, Greenwich Observatory. And from his biography, and uh, I'll read this, uh, the ruling feature of Airy, Airy's character was undoubtedly order. And you, you'll notice it, it was capitalized in the original he had the greatest dread of disorder creeping into the routine work of the observatory, even in the smallest matters. The great secret of his long and su successful career was that he was a good servant. He never set himself in opposition to his masters. And that worked both ways because <laughs> Carrington it didn't brook uh, uh, very much uh, nonsense from people who worked for them. He was, he was um, uh, you know, a, a micromanager and, and he liked it that way. Um, he was basically the science advisor to the British government, and he advised them on everything from uh, uh, tides to the gauge of the railway system to the chimes of Big Ben. And uh, Simon um, Newcomb said he was a, a well-known astronomer of the time, so we may look back on the area as the most commanding figure in the astronomy of his time. And it, I, I, there's no doubt about it. It wasn't just, it wasn't just in uh, England. So how did Carrington and Neri uh, interact? I mean, they worked at separate institutions, Red Hill Observatory or Durham versus uh, uh, the, uh, the Royal Observatory at Greenwich. Well, it was through the kind of the communal hall of, the, of uh, British astronomy, the Royal Astronomical Society. And um, there were uh, uh, both officials on that, uh, Airy and Carrington, for a period of about uh, 10 years. And so that's where they interacted and uh, got to know each other. And um, uh, Carrington obviously knew that to get anything done, he had to uh, get Airy's approval. And so he was always making uh, pitches or proposals to, uh, to Airy for all kinds of things, uh, uh, proposed Schwab for the gold medal and uh, he wanted to expand the uh, number of uh, meetings of the RAS from eight to 10. And uh, the rejoinder to that was, uh, if we do that, we probably won't have any, any officers uh, anymore. No one would be willing to do that. Uh, he wanted to survey the programs of all of the observatories, British and, and, uh, and foreign observatories, uh, to avoid duplication of effort. Uh, ahead of his time, in many ways, he, he wanted to establish a hill station for astronomy in India because the uh, observations are better the more of the atmosphere you get above. Uh, he uh, proposed allowing women to join the RAS's associates uh, in 1861, uh, and so and on. And, and later on, when he became uh, he became quite interested in the uh, in the uh, financial aspects of the RAS. Um, so uh, uh, kind of a permanent nuisance for Airy. And um, they, uh, the correspondence survives between um, um, Carrington and Airy, mainly because um, um, Airy, Airy kept a, a copy of everything he received and also everything he sent. Uh, Carrington himself did not leave an archive, but there's, there's other people he communicated with. And so that's... Uh, uh, how we, uh, we can get, gauge their relationship to each other. And so in their communications, it was always pretty cordial, pretty civil, and sometimes a little bit prickly. You can notice that on, on Aries' part, but it was always uh, your faithful servant and the usual closing of letters. Uh, but the gloves came off, came off when when Airy started talking to his cronies, and these were high-level cronies. Uh, Augustus de Morgan was uh, uh, is a well-known uh, mathematician, and uh, William Houle was the uh, master of uh, Trinity College for 25 years, and uh, he was a kind of a polymath. That he had a knack for uh, coining words, so to him we owe uh, ion, and anode, and cathode, and... Uh, 
escapes me right now. One, another one of them was um, astigmatism. Oh, the, the scientists. Before that, they were called uh, na uh, natural philosophers. So you can thank uh, William Hool for the for the term scientist. And so samples of the correspondence. So uh, Ari is writing to De Morgan, the mathematician. So he says, I'm in much greater fear of what that crack brain Carrington may do than of all the radicals can do. The radicals was a group in the, uh, in the uh, RAS who was running a different slate of officers or something. He said, and how to smire, smother his desire of interfering with everybody and his general busybodiness is as difficult as solving this uh, differential equation without imaginaries. And um, uh, De Morgan, uh, it took a more, uh, it was a more easy going certainly than Arian, took a more benign view of it. And he said, uh, Carrington is a queer fellow, but he has a medal for work. And Arian appreciated that too, I think he said. I don't think he, we have let him do any harm in a few years, more experience, and he'll be all right. Nothing but uh, uh, overzeal, uh, troublesome, but manageable. This was in 1858. Okay. Now remember, uh, uh, Carrington's uh, father had died. He's running his own observatory, uh, working, uh, uh, managing the brewery. And so he would very much like to get a government position and he was best suited to be a, a director of uh, an observatory. I mean, he had tremendous results from his own observatory. So in 1859, uh, the directorship of Radcliffe Observatory at Oxford became open and Aaron, uh, Carrington applied for it, um, uh, but uh, uh, so did uh, Robert Main, who was Aaron's first assistant. And you can uh, read this here and you don't have to read between the lines too much to see that um, Robert Main is uh, kind of the antithesis of, of um, uh, Carrington. He's not, a, he's not a boat rocker. And surprise, surprise, um, he got the job. And then um, a couple of years later, um, uh, an even stronger uh, language from uh, Ari to De Morgan, uh, like the second one, it says, I'm indignant with Carrington's policy of intermeddling. I don't, do not see thing, how things can go on unless Carrington uh, be shelved, whatever whatever that means, and um, and and the, and the top quote he he, he uh, threatens to resign if Airy uh, or if, if Carrington were made president. And this Airy uh, threatened to resign uh, several times during his career. So he was pretty good at bluffing. So then, um, so if the uh, the three big observa um, uh, universities. Uh, uh, Durham and Oxford, the third one uh, now had an opening and Carrington applied for that as well. Um, and he wrote to he wrote to Carrington and asked him for support. And uh, uh, Carrington's, or uh, Aries uh, reply could not have given him any comfort at all. Uh, Aries replied, uh, I do not think it at all likely that I shall be in any way consulted, you know, hogwash, uh, but if I were, so far as my present impressions go, I can definitely uh, state directly that uh, what I would recommend, and I should certainly detach the observatory from a professorship and connect it with one professorship connected with another one. But then uh, the really chilling stuff, he said, but I, uh, in any case, I should not appoint any other curator at the observatory on terms which would invite yourself or any, anybody else to apply. So they, they wanted to have someone from the inside but he said, "Don't worry; they're not going to ask me." Well, he had made his he had made his choice clear uh, a couple of years later when uh, one of the professors died and had to be replaced, and um, and he, and he replaced him with uh, uh, John Adams. And uh, this is fifty eight. He said, "In any case, I hope that Adams will be attached to astronomy uh, in the university somehow." And so that happened. Uh, he became the professor in 59 and in 1861 accepted the directorship. So uh, Carrington was incensed. Uh, in, incensed uh, uh, he wrote four letters to the university and he said, uh, 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 passing him over uh, for the um, vacant directorship 
uh, is in the same league as if someone had appointed him to uh, be a downing professor of laws or a first surgeon uh, to Guy's Hospital. He, he really was the best qualified uh, person, uh, at least in a technical sense, uh, for those jobs. And Erie was relieved. He says, you're good. To, he wrote to Houle, uh, who was uh, the head of the committee uh, that uh, that that uh, uh, picked Adam, said he has good intentions for what that's worth. And he said, if you would have hired him, you'd have, it would have ended up in a lawsuit and criminal <laughs> prosecution. So the aftermath is that uh, Carrington um, ceased his sunspot observations. Um, uh, he sold uh, Red Hill Observatory. Uh, and he spent a couple of years uh, writing this uh, a book, Observation of Spots on the Sun, uh, recording all of his observations and findings. And in 1864, uh, for this, he was awarded the Land Prize uh, by the French Academy of Science, Sciences. Uh, but things uh, uh, turned then. He had a, a serious illness in 1865. It's, it's not certain what it was, but it was most likely a stroke because that's what his father died of, uh, relatively young as well. And descriptions of him at this time are that he's he's boiling, he's angry, so uh, it's not it's not too surprising. He built this uh, kind of uh, unique and um, uh, elaborate uh, observatory a church where he moved, but he never got um, uh, any successful or worthwhile observations from it. He had an ill-fated marriage in 1869, and that's a euphemism. It was worse than that. He um, he died age 49 in uh, 1875. And if you'd like to read more about the personal aspects of that, uh, I greatly encourage this book called The uh, Sun Kings uh, this, uh, by Stuart Clark. It talks not only about um, uh, Carrington, but also about uh, uh, Maunder and, and uh, others of that uh, era. And so the final words, um, uh, Agnes Clerk uh, described him rightly as a self-constituted astron astronomer gifted with the courage and instinct of thoughtful labor. Ralph Sampson, a uh, well-known astronomer from Durham uh, University uh, wrote in 1903 that if Carrington had been re retained, he thought they would have a, a, without doubt an observatory at Durham that would have ranked with the well-known observatories of the world. And Harold Newton, the third of the great uh, English sunspot observers after Carrington and Maunder, uh, described the observations of spots on the sun as a classic studied with feelings of admiration by all sunspot observers. So, thank you. So, uh, please, any, any questions? Did, did Carrington use photography seriously or uh, was it too new for him? It was it was too new for him, and but it was a calculated decision. He knew it was coming, and he actually wrote. He mm -hmm. thought he could have a good har he could make a good harvest before uh, before it was perfected. And he was right. He made those you know key discoveries uh, be before uh, uh, photography came into widespread use. And then so he never he never uh, used photography himself. George, yeah, yeah, and. I really enjoyed your talk. Um, since we're all uh, people that use telescopes, what size telescope did Carrington use when he saw the flare? I think it was uh, it was either like it was um, ten or twelve. I think something like that. Ten, ten or twelve. 12 inches, ten or twelve inches uh, of that of that order. I thought this was very, very interesting, and I, it's fascinating that we look at stars all the time and don't understand what we're looking at, all the activities that are going on with them, as well as the history that it, that has brought us to this point in time, because we've talked, and the government, a number of times about from critical infrastructure, things like Carrington event, not understanding a lot of the background and, and, and even the science really that well. So this has been very interesting to me personally, as well as I'm sure to everyone that's on the line tonight. And we really appreciate your time and er energy on, on this subject because it's fascinating and there's all sorts of things, obviously more to it, but it's been been very interesting for a warm <laughs> summer night. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, thank you. I mean, yeah, I, mean, I was curious, you know, um, uh, just how familiar people uh, were with Carrington's name, or, or is that is that in you know in, in the Stellar community? Um, uh, is is um, is he recognized or is it, Yeah, well, yes, I think the name is recognized. I mean, and I think the probably, you know, George can talk more about this perhaps, but I mean, I think in, we've talked about it in NASA, some of the things that I do for ed education for them on a couple of different times. And mm -hmm. like I said, um, at DHS, we talked about it in critical infrastructure, especially for uh, power grid distribution, things like that. So it's it's come up a couple of different ways in different times and places. And, and, and just recently, of course, when we had another CME, people started asking questions about that. You know, it goes backwards from the, we had a lot of people asking about auroras. Where do they come from? Well, let's go backwards in that conversation and get back to talking about things like carrying an event and not really the part that you really made clear was where it fits within the the scheme of what we know of, of events that have gone on. So obviously there's another one coming, but um, you know, it's just yeah. a matter of time. Mm -hmm. George, did you have anything else or anyone else? Yeah, I, I think, uh, I think people are getting to know it because of all the studies being made on what would happen if we had another Carrington event and we didn't do anything about it and what would, how much damage was such a, a, an event caused. So, because of space weather, um, I think people are in general getting to know about the character event because it's usually described as the biggest, biggest one that occurred, and things are compared to the character event. Hmm. You know, do we get out in space more with commercial space uh, exploding? All of those things are much more vulnerable to those sort of events that no one's really yeah. contemplated. And so I think now people are going to wake up that a it's not that benign to go out in space. It can it can be it can be a lot worse than you think. Well, when Carrington's event occurred, didn't it, it set telegraph offices on the ground on right. fire? I mean, it was it was a massive event, and that's when everything was on the ground, protected by the atmosphere and so on. But but when you got to put put all the stuff in space, that's a, then it becomes we become more vulnerable to what the sun can do to us. The, the the big uh, uh, big problem there is with uh, well you know damage to sensors and those kinds of things from particle events, but also yeah. the uh, satellite drag, heating of the atmosphere, yeah. and increases the drag, and then you have to look for your satellites again. <laughs> right, your orbits go to your, your orbits be very difficult to predict when things like that happen. And more now. Yeah, so yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, we're going to Dan, you had a question about uh, filtered or unfiltered observations. I'm not sure you can see it. So. Yeah, Dan asked where the sunspot studies projected images are yeah. filtered. Yes, yeah, they were they were projected. Yeah, projected on a screen, and then then he would uh, uh, do his um, uh, tracing. That's it on the question. I'll do a follow up on that. Uh, in general, was was all of the work then all projected, or were they using something other than smoke glass uh, for filtering? Uh, both. I mean, they, they were both. I think I think the more uh, the more serious ones were doing projection, but um, say the other observatory, Hodgson, who saw that first flare, was looking through smoke glass. Mm -hmm. We have some more. Yeah, Paul, go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, is there uh, is there any chance that there could have been other Carrington events that but but they were pointed away from the Earth that uh, you know that may not have made this unique? Oh, good, or is that good question. Event? And that's that's it. Yeah, it, it, yes. And in fact, there was an event in 2012 that was on the backside of the sun, but now we have satellites there, uh, the stereo satellites. Um, you know, go and can and, and uh, go around the sun on the backside, and they reckon that event would have been uh, would have caused uh, uh, a magnetic storm uh, comparable, uh, based on its um, its speed and also uh, the, the the magnetic field strength in that uh, in the um, uh, coronal mass ejection. So, so it's possible it could have been there could be it could not have been a hundred year event. There may there may have 
occur more often than that. Is that true? Yes. Yeah. You can you could effectively double it. I guess you know. I mean, I was just using that as as a, not a, not as a, a hard metric anyway, but it's it's a you know how we would talk about storms at Earth. But you're right. I mean, if and it doesn't have to be behind the sun. If it's on either limb, uh, uh, you know, uh, of the sun, it's it's going 90 degrees from you. So uh, the ones that are the strongest are the ones that are right at the central meridian because uh, they're directed right toward you. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Christopher Spain made a comment that the people here in the room didn't get. I think Harrington event was in several news and popular science articles I read after the recent solar activity. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I, it, 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 it invariably shows <laughs> shows up the Carrington event when there's a when there's a, when there's a biggest storm, especially. Um, I mean, this last one in May. I mean, you see a lot of you know. I see a lot uh, more often that there's uh, even on national news there's uh, uh, forecasting of big events, but um, uh, the one in 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 uh, May I think met the standard, you know, I mean, for, for, a, for, a, for a healthy event. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Well, again, sir, thank you very, very, thank you very much for your time and for your presentation. It was really great. We really enjoyed it. And um, I'm sure, Oh, I'm sorry. One more popped up. <laughs> we keep talking. They'll keep coming. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. It was my pleasure. Yeah. One more question. One more question. I'm so sorry. Okay. Or his contemporaries uh, ever express any knowledge of what they thought powered the sun? Did you hear that, sir? Um, did Carrington or his uh, colleagues ever have an opinion as to what powered the sun? Did they understand what was going on in the the basic? Uh, for forces causing the sun to operate the way it does. Do I, about that? I think I think the answer is is no, and I think it's still an open <laughs> an open question. And and George, I, I don't know if you saw that. I mean, recently I saw a paper on the solar dynamo that you know what, what powers the sun. And, and the conventional wisdom is it's down at the it's well uh, centered well in the in the convection zone deep in the sun. Yes. And they said this was, uh, and these guys sounded like they know what they were talking about. Said they think it's at the surface. Yeah. No, I haven't seen that. Said, haven't oh, seen. Yeah, it was in, uh, it was in, it was in something. I think it was in Nature or something like that. I'll, mm -hmm. I'll send you a copy of it. Okay. Yeah. Again, well, again, um, thank you very much for your time, sir. Thank you, George, for, for inviting this wonderful gentleman to talk to us tonight. And and if, with, if we have another further questions, we're done for the night. Thank you all again, and we'll see you next month.